I have had family in Australia ever since I was a kid. I didn't get to see them very often, but when I did, my cousins would usually always tell me about a neighbor they had. They'd tell me all these stories about how weird he was, how creepy he was, and so on and so forth. Well, come summertime, I'm out on break from school and my dad suggests going to visit them for a few weeks. Beyond excited, I agreed to it, and we flew out later that month. It was actually a really wholesome experience seeing them that year. I think someone just got married so everyone was all bubbly. Either way, I'm hanging out with my cousins and they bring up the weird neighbor again, saying he got divorced and how it was probably because he was so ugly. I don't know, just something cruel that kids would say. While we giggled and made all these hyperbolic statements about how ugly he could be, I did feel sorry for the guy. Being divorced simply because your partner doesn't think you're attractive anymore, that must have hurt anyone's feelings. The following morning, I wake up before everyone else and I'm just outside swinging on their swing set. I finally saw the neighbor out that morning and decided that it was time someone was nice to them. My cousins can joke all they want, but maybe the guy wasn't anything like they said. Besides, none of them actually spoke to him, so I'd be the first one to do so. I went up, greeted him, and just like that, we got to talking. He was actually rather soft-spoken, maybe even a little shy, but it felt like he meant well. He was loading garbage bags into his car when I went over, so I helped him out. I didn't think that he was weird or anything, just that he was an old fellow that could have used some conversation. We loaded up the trunk with the bag and he left, waving me goodbye. My dad and I left Australia a few days later and I finished up my summer break at home, completely forgetting about the neighbor. Fast forward 13 years later and my cousins come to the States to visit me. By this point, I had my own apartment so it was just my cousins and me while my aunts and uncles went to my dad's. We got to talking about old memories and finally the topic of their neighbor came up. I mentioned how I didn't think that he was as weird as they said and he seemed like a caring, nice old man when I helped him with his bags. Suddenly, everyone just stops immediately. Wait, do you know? Is this like a joke or something? One of them said, and I shake my head and comment that, again, I thought that he was nice. The bags. How did you find out about the bags? Another cousin spits out. They're all just staring at me, shocked while I was clearly showing that I wasn't playing some joke or prank on them. And finally I say, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. I spoke to him once while we were loading trash into his car and I helped him. Immediately, several of them get up and pace around the room, while another puts their head in their hands. It turns out, he wasn't actually divorced, but rather he found out his wife was cheating on him and proceeded to kill her. Everyone in town knew that she was a cheater, so once she vanished, the town just assumed that she left him. And so on that specific day, he was dumping his wife's chopped up body into his car. And I, a 12-year-old little wholesome teenager who was just trying to be nice, was his accomplice. Ever since finding that out, the summer is no longer just a hot season or a break from school. To me, it's the season that I dragged around a dead body. I know carnivals often have a layer of controversy to them, either because of clowns or because of some creep who ruins someone's experience. So I've decided that I'll share my story because it involves both of those. It was 2016, middle of September, and the county fair always comes to town during this time of year. Being a good brother, I promised to take my little sister who was only four years old at the time to the fair. The time comes around, I get off of work, and we get there at about 6 p.m. I let her ride on the kitty rides, eat funnel cakes and other fried foods, all the good stuff. She's having a fun time, and that's all that mattered to me. We weren't having a great time at home, and so I just wanted my sister to have a good time somewhere else. After I lost a game at getting her a large stuffed animal, we walked over to the snack bar to cheer her up when a clown walked up next to us. Now... I was weirded out, 
seeing that this was the only clown we had seen since arriving there, but I figured that he noticed her being sad over the stuffed animal and wanted to cheer her up. Maybe for a cash tip, I don't know. He was an old looking man, probably in his 60s, and seemed like your standard carny man. I don't mean any disrespect, it's just that he seemed like he was built entirely for the circus or carnival or whatever. So, he greets my little sister and makes her this little balloon animal. She instantly cheers up, smiling at him, and he returns a big grin. I thank him, but he ignores me and walks off, really playing the bit, I think to myself. The stand we originally went to was out of soda, so we made our way over to another nacho stand and I ordered her some nachos. Food meant comfort to me, so I figured I'd spoil her. While we ate, I noticed the same clown we had met earlier was leaning against a game booth, along with another guy who looked much younger than him. Think maybe mid-thirties with long hair, a muscular build, and a few tattoos on his arms, and both of them were staring at us. I try to keep my profile low as I watch them keep saying stuff to each other, but unfortunately, they were way too far away for me to comprehend what was being said. But from the way they looked, I knew it couldn't have been kind words. Finally, they catch me looking at them and the clown gives me a light grin, exposing a few yellow, crooked teeth as well. I give him a nod back and try to think nothing of it. We finish up and go about our business. About an hour later, we're getting ready to leave, as she started complaining about her stomach. My fault too, but I loved watching her be all giddy about fried Snickers bars. As we're packing stuff up into my bag, I notice that the same two guys from earlier are sitting at a bench near me. They don't notice me again, and this time, I unfortunately hear their conversation. Old guy says, The little blonde girl was the one I liked. The one in the black shirt with the flowers. I would have gone up to her too, but the guy wouldn't let her leave his sight for nothing. She was eyeing you too. All real friendly like. Probably wouldn't have put up much of a struggle if you just snatched her. I heard the younger guy saying back to him. The younger guy then turns to his side and looks at my sister and I pretend not to notice. Hey, isn't that her right there? I watch as the old guy flashes her a wink and that's when I freak out. I began raging at them, picking up my sister at the same time and tell them that I'm contacting the police. And without another word, I ran off with her in my arms. I ended up contacting the police and they tell me that they'll investigate it. Eventually, I get a call from the police telling me that there's no leads yet, but whoever it was, they didn't even work there. The police went on to tell me that the company that runs the fair doesn't even employ any clowns. I used to hang out with my friend in Dublin when I was 15. Normally I'm from the countryside, so this was a pretty cool time away from things. One day, he and I went to hang out with two girls in a park somewhere. He says he knows them pretty well, so I trusted him and went along. We all were just chilling outside beside some trees, relaxing in the shade on a nice sunny dry day. The girls were actually pretty cool to be around, if I remember, until all of a sudden, some forty-something guy approaches us. He looked completely disheveled, eyes looked exhausted, and he was clearly not all there in his mind. We're friendly towards him, making small talk and humoring him as he asked us who we were. But then out of nowhere, he starts to get sort of aggressive. He begins standing too close to the girls, raising his voice irrationally, not exactly mad, but very loud and forceful. We all want to bail as we try to politely come up with an excuse to leave, and that's when the man takes a real close shine to the one girl, Grace, and suddenly rambles out. Grace, I'll take you, and we can get married. Look, I have a car and he pulls out actual car keys. The way he talked about the keys made it definitely obvious that they weren't his, which was even more concerning. Freaked out, we just got up and started walking away at this point. Grace's friend is still trying to be like, Okay, see you later. Bye now. Bye. But instead, the man starts closing the gap between us. He starts shouting 
in a rage demanding to know where Grace was going. And that's something that I wondered about from time to time. Like, did the rest of us even exist in his mind? Or was it all about Grace? Anyway, the guy starts jogging towards us and we drop the nice act and break out into a full-on sprint. I don't even look back as I'm sprinting because a part of me knew that he was giving chase after us and he just screams out again. Grace! Grace! I love you! Finally, we all turned around to see where he was as we got to the edge of the park and it looked to be that he tripped near one of the trees. He was just rolling around on the ground, kicking up clouds of dust and screaming incoherently. Before anyone even could call 911, these two strangers in coats arrived at the park, catching him as he screamed out in a rage. Turns out, my friend forgot that the central mental hospital was right around the corner from the park, which means the guy was probably some highly dangerous forensic patient and likely attacked someone before. The keys he had, well, they could have been anything, might have been stolen from a doctor or nurse and aided him in his escape. When I was 16, my dad dated this horrible woman who I'll just call Suzanne. So Christmas was coming up and my dad decided to uproot the family tradition of spending holidays together just so he could spend Christmas at her place. This caused a huge argument one night over dinner and even years later, things are still shaky. I called him names, I called Suzanne names and then I got kicked out. I was told to fix my behavior, respect my elders, all that stuff teenagers usually get. Luckily, my uncle at the time also didn't like Suzanne, so when finding out about this, he lectured my dad, my uncle was the oldest sibling between them all, and then let me stay at his place over Christmas break. My uncle picked me up the following weekend. He lives rather secluded with a nice house up in the mountains. There's a good amount of land that belongs to him, but his neighbor's land is vastly larger. One night, I decided to use the land to my advantage so I told my uncle I was going for a walk and then snuck off to get high. Before I left, he told me that it's fine to walk around but to just make sure that I stay on his side of the property line. Apparently his neighbor had shot some hunter chasing a wounded deer onto his property earlier that year. I started to look around for somewhere not visible from the house, which is harder than it sounds because the house has huge windows everywhere. I finally spotted an old shed on the neighbor's side of the property line and went to check it out. The door had a padlock, but the guy left the key in, so I unlocked it and stepped inside. Suddenly, I'm smacked by this raunchy smell. I mean, it hits me like a freight train. It's like a dead raccoon or sun-cooked roadkill, but a hundred times worse. Instantly, I dart away from the shed and nearly vomit, thinking that I might have stumbled into a serial killer's base or something. I took lots of deep breaths before finally working up the courage to walk back in there. I turn on my phone flashlight and shine it inside and am disgusted with what I see. Small, decapitated animal carcasses. Everywhere. There's animal bodies piled up against the wall. A few rabbits and a coyote nailed to the wall or at least what I think used to be a coyote. The walls and the floors of the shed are all caked in dried blood and what I can only describe as miscellaneous gore. I don't even check my surroundings. I just instantly nope out of there, and I ended up just walking down the street to get high behind a 7-Eleven. After some years, I went back and heard some rumor about the neighbor actually shooting himself. Shed was long gone by that point, apparently. Honestly, I'm just glad that he didn't catch me snooping around. I was participating in a reenactment one year. This was a Vietnam one, so I had my AR-15 along with several extra blank loaded magazines, and it was getting very dark, and most of the crowd had left. We talked to the group's captain, and he recommended night practice basically a patrol in this abandoned cornfield. It sounded fun, so I said yes. After the first two scenarios were done, I was placed on the Op 4, opposing force side. 
I went into the woods and waited, and that's when I first noticed that it was dead silent. All that could be heard was the occasional gust of wind through the dead stalks of corn. I glanced around the forest, then crawled out when the wind started up again. Two loud cracks then filled the air, and I watched as an Op 4 walked out of the cornfield with his weapon up. This was followed by something standing up near the corn and firing again. Now, if you've never shot at night, it's a sight to see. The sudden light of the gun's flash makes everything freeze in time. It's to the point that you can quickly survey the area after a shot's fired, or so you think. Anyway, he's soon taken down as well, so I continue into the cornfield and lie down in a nice spot, hoping they'll come my way. I rest my rifle in a nice spot on my shoulder and everything kind of goes quiet. And that's when I hear a deep breathing beside me. I slowly turn my head, looking to my right. It's pitch black out so I can't see anything. I could use my light but that would give my position away at this point. I peer through the blanket of darkness, seeing what looked like fur. I slowly rolled over to my side and drew my knife just in case it was a predator. Look, I at least wanted a fighting chance, I suppose. But then something moved in front of me. I quickly readjusted but missed what it was. When I glanced back to where the breathing was, it was empty. I soon got up and moved, somewhat shaken at this point. And that's when I heard another two cracks, along with the captain, laughing. I walked right into his line of fire. And that was it. The game's done. His next idea was using the woods only. I loaded up a fresh mag and began to follow him in. It's him, me, and a Viet Cong actor that was there for the actual event. I was at the back in case they tried to flank the rear. After a few minutes of walking, I heard a rustling nearby. I called for them to hold it, then took a knee and looked toward the bushes where I heard the noise. I saw what looked like a person standing there, but that's all they were doing, just standing. Figuring that it was op for, I fired. Everything froze and I could see what can only be described as a person that was dragged out from hell. They were beaten up and mangled looking, with pale white eyes. I tried to take a closer look and focus, but it went black again. The captain glared at me for letting our position be known when there was nothing there. He didn't see whatever it was. We continued down the trail and hit the ambush, winning the fight. We gathered up, cleared our weapons, then began the trek back to camp. When we reached the field, I glanced around the group. We'd gone out with six, and I now counted seven, including myself, in both times. Strange, but maybe I'd miscounted before. After all, it was dark and I was tired. When we reached the camp, I decided to count again. Six, including me. Something wasn't right. I asked about the other guy that was with us and got funny looks as a response, so I just ignored it and went to sleep. The rest of the time was thankfully uneventful. I've looked into this recently, and I want to say Skinwalker, but it doesn't fit the stereotypes. This thing didn't do harm or lure one of us out for an attack. Either way, I haven't gone out at night for patrols since then. This story still makes me uncomfortable to this day. I was out with friends at a party at some girl's parents' log cabin in the middle of nowhere. Late into the party, I ended up getting separated from my friends and decided to chat up some random people. I like being friendly with people and it comes much easier to me once I have a drink or two flowing through me. So I get into a random conversation with some guy and his friend talking about whatever. I distinctly remember that one of the guys is brown haired while the other one is blonde and looks like he hadn't slept in three days. I casually mentioned how hard it was to find this place given that it's in the middle of nowhere. All of a sudden, the brown haired guy looked at me with a really worried look and his blonde friend stands up, probably over two meters tall and skinny as a tree branch. The blonde guy starts laughing about how I couldn't find my way here. Confused. I asked what he means as there are no other houses nearby. 
I continue about how, as mentioned before, it's in the middle of nowhere and that I had to drive two hours by car to get here. His voice starts shaking, for lack of a better word, almost like it was changing pitch on every word that came out. He says something about how stupid I am for thinking that. And so I, being a bit drunk and an overall aggressive teenager at the time, tell him that he shouldn't call me stupid or I'll beat him where he stands. The blonde guy just looks at me with this eye-piercing gaze and says, Oh, you will? Do you want to take it outside? His brown-haired friend is visibly scared, but I continue to look into the blonde's eyes, and they are, without a doubt, the most terrifying thing I'd ever seen. And look, at this point, I had already been in my fair share of fistfights, plus I was drunk and I'd done some coke, so generally I wouldn't really think twice about beating some skinny lanklet. But something about this dude just screamed danger, like every cell in my body was urging for me to move. Suddenly, I start sweating and feeling faint, like I'm about to pass out, and he says, I want to take you outside. And like that, I promptly pass out. I wake up, not five minutes later, but my friends who are asking where I went and why I'm lying in the backyard. I looked around and saw that I was lying next to the opening of the forest. We went inside the cabin and into the place I was sitting just five minutes prior. Before, there weren't any people in the room, but now it seemed packed. Then it hits me. During the time that I was talking to these two guys, which must have been about 15 minutes, not once did I see another person or even hear one. My friends comment that I must have vanished for over an hour, which I guess lined right up with the timing. Finally, I asked about the guys, to which nobody knows what I'm talking about. My friends had been in the room that I was in for quite some time, and not once had they seen me, nor the blonde and brunette that I was describing. We go around, questioning everyone, and we find out that there were no two people like that at the party, nor anyone invited that fit their descriptions. Sometimes I have nightmares about this to this very day. I still don't know what happened to me, to be honest. Do any of you guys have literally any idea? When I was about 10 years old, I had to go to speech therapy maybe three times a week. I had a bit of a stutter and a lisp, so I was quite the regular by the time this happened. The place we went to was quite a distance away from town, so we would pull up, my mom would let me out, and I'd go in there alone after school. Then, my mom would pick me up after it was all said and done. She always said that she had errands to run, but I think she just didn't want to go in with me. This actually allowed me to open up more about troubling problems I had at home since no one was around to correct what I told the therapist. So one day, I get dropped off and begin the session as usual. Once it was nearly over, my therapist left the room and crossed the waiting room to get something from her bureau. Now, I can't see the waiting room since her office was pointed into the hallway, but I could hear the therapist talking to someone. This surprised me. Honestly, because every time I entered the building, it always seemed empty with no other clients. Of course, that was just my child brain's logic, and I probably was coming in at a dead time. But suddenly I hear, Yes, we'll finish in just a minute. He's doing well today. To which I hear another voice say, Fine, I'll wait. It sort of dawned on me that I didn't recognize that voice. It wasn't the reception, and she was definitely referring to me. On top of that, my therapist was only talking with me the last hour or so and didn't take any calls nor see other clients. So she comes back and tells me that my mother is already waiting in the lobby, which again doesn't add up because she never came inside. Shortly afterwards, I got into the waiting room and, of course, my mom is nowhere to be seen. I give the situation the benefit of the doubt because, hey, maybe she was in the bathroom or something, so I waited for a while. Eventually, I checked the restroom, and there again, zero trace of my mother. My mom wasn't a smoker either, so she couldn't have stepped outside for that, but at this point, I had no ideas left in my mind. So I walk out and go down to the parking lot, and lo and behold, our car isn't even there. Now I'm left stranded at this building with literally no one inside, yet there was apparently someone nearby who 
came to pick me up. I walk back up to the front doors and I continue to wait. Approximately 10 minutes later, our car finally pulls up. My mom keeps apologizing and tells me that she's late because of a traffic jam. And I asked if she stopped by earlier and she said no, that there was some crash that took out the bridge that exits town and that she was in a jam for the last 40 minutes. I look at her, shrug my shoulders and get in. Nothing like this has ever happened again, so I guess that just leaves me with a question. Who did my therapist see and talk to in the waiting room? Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. Hey X, I've got something interesting enough to bring me here to post this. I hope some of you can perhaps give me some insight as to what I experienced. I was just another average 8 or 9 year old kid living in Utah, wasting a summer vacation while life was still fun. Out behind my house, practically in my backyard, was a huge embankment at the mouth of a canyon coming from some nearby mountains. There was a drainage pipe that acted as an outlet for the little water that came down from the canyon at the base of the wall, right above this big old pile of accumulated sand. It was like a perfect natural sandbox with a natural garden hose providing a constant steady trickle of water. This was easily visible from the back windows of my house, and this allowed for my mom to watch me play from within the house and she'd let me mess around all day at the base of the pipe. Back then, I was a huge dinosaur nut and had a bunch of those nice cool collection models that a destructive kid like me should never have. I would take a bucket full of these out to what I'll just call the sandbox every day and would create little river systems, immersing myself in some fantasy anarchist society that I'd created for my dinosaurs. I would sit out in the sun for hours and get sunburned pretty much every day with a neighborhood kid who was kind enough to tolerate me. I believe I did this on and off for the majority of the first half of the summer, and the way kids pass time, man, it's something else. In mid-July, it started to rain more and one night we got hit with a decent thunderstorm. I lay in bed that night, no doubt anticipating the new mud pit environment I'd be able to play in the next day. I got so excited that I could barely sleep that night, and so I got up at an hour that no doubt upset my parents and headed right out to my sandbox, not even bothering to wait for my friend. When I arrived, a significant amount of water was coming out of the pipe and a small pond had formed where I usually played. I played with my newly created lake for about half an hour as the sun rose a little bit. By this time, it had to be 7 or 8 in the morning and I was sticking dinosaur toys in the shallow mud and trying to balance other toys on pieces of floating wood debris. When something floated next to my hands. I went to push it away because it was on a collision course with one of my improvised boats but ended up recoiling from it. You know when you're a little kid and something startles you so badly that you don't even scream? You just kind of stare and retreat back a little while your heart jackhammers in your chest. That's what I did. Whatever this thing was that floated up next to me, it was about the size of a guinea pig. And I'm using an animal as a comparison because whatever it was, it was definitely something organic but it sure wasn't any animal or living thing I had ever seen or seen ever since. And it still freaks me out to think about, honestly. It floated in a low current region at the edge of the pool for a few seconds, and I got a decent look at it. It had that fatty pink-gray waterlog color of something that had been dead and in the water for a little while, but not yet decomposing or falling apart. It definitely had a head and a torso from which trailed half a dozen tentacle-like things splayed out around in the water with a couple dragging in the mud. The thing was hairless, nor did it look like it even had hair, but it wasn't scaly either. But the worst of all was its face. Not a human face, not even close, but definitely a face. It reminded me slightly of the face of a pug or bat, all wrinkled and flat. It had a toothless, slack open mouth and I could see one of its eyes which had that dead, custard-like color. I was so scared that 
all childish desire to examine it or poke it with a stick was gone. I quickly retreated back to my house and told my mom what I had seen. My mom seemed both worried and interested and accompanied me back out so I could show her. By then, the current had carried it away along with a couple of my dinosaurs which to me at the time was almost as equally as upsetting as seeing the dead corpse itself. We looked around and found one of the dinosaurs but never found the body or any remnants of its tentacles. I was too nervous to play there for the next couple of days which worried my parents because I really loved playing out there. They tried to convince me that it was just a decaying dead animal and so eventually I got over it and went on playing. A few years later when I was 13 or 14 the whole incident flooded back in my mind and I tried to explore up the canyon to see if I could find anything but of course I didn't. I never forgot the way it looked. I know it could partially be explained away as the result of a creative childish mind or that it really was the decomposed remains of something else but I remember it very clearly, more clearly than any other childhood memories. I had searched the internet for explanations and haven't found anything. I have even looked into cryptids and the like, but nothing fits its description to a T. When I was 18, after high school final exams, I was selected for some of the preparatory classes to the most difficult selective schools that exist in my country. Despite how pretentious it sounds, I didn't even want that in the first place. But long story short, my father forced me to go, so I moved up to these classes the next year in another city. Once there, I was assigned to a paid room with a roommate. At very first glance, he appears to be okay, just a little bit annoying, like he was playing his music at loud volumes and rapidly became unsettlingly familiar with me and yet I still barely knew him. I mean, he was like giving me nicknames already right out the gate. I'm not much for conversation or socializing in general, so as time went on, things began to get worse and worse. I was extremely introverted at the time, so I guess I became a perfect prey for him. He would start to try to guess personal information about me, like if I was a virgin or if I had ever kissed someone before. He'd become intrusive and use whatever I would naively confess about my personal life in order to demean me, and it progressed to the point where he really was just trying to verbally humiliate me. I was very isolated, so maybe I was too responsive to that. He would often get on my bed as I was lying down reading and make these weird comments about a teacher he liked. Then he would lay in what I can only describe a rather ambiguous pose. Then came the physical altercations. It started off with punches on my arm or smacks on my back, ones that could be played off with him just messing around. One day, out of nowhere, he shoved me across the kitchen, and I had enough and just shoved him back. I remember he stared at me in both confusion and humiliation, like how dare someone do it back to him. From there on, he never roughhoused in a friendly way, but more in that I'm alpha way from pushing me away from doors so he could enter rooms first to randomly putting me in chokeholds in front of girls. It finally got to the point that one day he would block me in the bathroom just to beat me up on the floor, all just for fun I guess. You might think to this point that it was just kind of hardcore bullying but it was blatant for me that the guy was actually simply wanting to gain power on someone that appeared to be weak for no reason and he could be physically violent at times even if the worst part was simply emotional manipulation. Personally, I have no doubts in my mind that he could likely be a narcissistic pervert or something close to that. So I skipped that class after a few months, partly because of him, but also because the class was dreadful in general. One night, years later, I decided to see what his deal was, where he was going and how he made it into those classes with me. So after checking his name out on the internet, I found out even more unsettling news. Not only was he some senator's rich snobby kid, which explains the ego and the fact that he was in a selective school, but that he was in the process of becoming a teacher. This guy will have students under his will, and that is the most concerning part to me.
I have some exploration stories that I feel should be shared. I work as a contractor for this maintenance crew, but since we're a rather small team, jobs often get split up. So one day, I was late with my maintenance at this one spot that was enshrouded by massive blackberry bushes. The only way that I could get out at that point was to exit via a tunnel that I had to cut into the bushes. But even after I got through the thick bushes, it was too dark to walk back on the mountain trail so I had to sleep on sight. It was May and still pretty cold in the mountains and I only had a cotton parka jacket with me which was completely wet from digging deep holes all day. Along with this, I had a small utility tarp that I was using to mix soil, but I didn't have any cord to create a faux tent. I used my pack and bags with soil conditioners as a pad and the tarp as a blanket. Falling asleep was easy, but the actual sleep itself was rough. In the middle of the night, in absolute darkness, I woke up hearing frightening sounds that I obviously can say I'd never heard before. Every five seconds, I'd hear what sounded like cries from a large bird, but the sound was emanating from behind the blackberry bushes and I could tell that it was screaming at me. If I were to estimate from the sound of it, this animal must have had a voice box about the size of a pig or dog. I mean, you could tell that it was large, but soon I noticed that there were also several other cries and they were circling around my sleeping spot. And this went on for a good hour. Absolutely terrifying, and I still don't know what it was. Another time, I hiked to a location that I needed to get to that night. On my way there, apparently a storm had broken off quite a few large branches from some trees, and I had to move them out of the way. They were massive, making it difficult to move through the thicket. Only an adult would be able to move them, when I was walking back about two hours later, around dusk, I was absolutely sure that nobody else was around me, just me and nature. As usual, I could hear the birds' warning cries from the storm and could see every spider web overstretching the path that I had avoided previously. I could see fields of golden rod still untouched. I'm only mentioning this because I need to hammer home that once again, I'm absolutely sure that there was no other living person around here at the time of this. But when I came back to the section of the path, the branches I had moved earlier were now moved back into the middle of the path. There was zero chance that they had just rolled back onto the path as I rolled them down a slope. There isn't even a parking lot or a nearby road. Something picked up those branches, walked them up the slope, and placed them where I had once moved them from. I've never seen a single soul in that area. Another thing that scared me quite a bit was an experience I had during winter. I was sleeping in just a sleeping bag in a section of the forest that I thought I knew quite well, and I had my campsite on a small elevation overlooking a small glade. There was light snowfall, and the dark clouds above in the night sky were moving fast and occasionally revealed the stars. There were no other sounds, so you could hear everything quite clearly. However, after some time, I was sure that there is something in the woods that is laughing in a mischievous, perfidious fashion right at the other side of the glade. It occurred a few times per minute, but sometimes there was nothing at all for a while. I estimated the origin of the sound to come from slightly higher up, as if something would be sitting in the branches above, as if I was being watched by whatever it was. Coyotes can't climb trees, that's more of a feline trait. However, based on these observations, I think that there was a spirit in the forest that can be benevolent or malevolent, depending on what you're doing there. All of these events happened during a time where I had been intruding or messing around with the forest in these locations, so that might be a reason why this happened. I know it's weird to pinpoint in on forest ghosts, but ever since I got recruited to a different employer, I am now only going out for recreational hikes and Nothing like this has happened again. The next one is much more unsettling. The horrifying story of John Jones, a 26-year-old young man who decided to explore narrow tunnels on November 24, 2009 with his brother, Josh. What started as a simple exploration into the Nutty Putty Caves west of Utah Lake would turn into a nightmare. John grew up in the area and was even familiar with the caves since he visited them several times. He knew what safety measures he had to take to explore them since they contain a network of tunnels 
narrow enough for a person of average height to pass through with hands and knees. That faithful November 24th, Josh decided to organize an exploration of the Nutty Putty Cave since John was visiting Utah and would be staying for the holidays. John, who had always liked exploration, accepted, along with nine other people including friends and family. However, his wife Emily was expecting their second child, so she didn't go. Finally, the group arrived at eight at night and began to descend through the caves. They wanted the challenge to pass the narrowest tunnels of the place, and for this, they needed to make a series of stealth movements. An hour after having entered the caves, the group separated into a formation called the Birth Canal, which would send them to narrower caves in the shape of a circle. But John ended up choosing the wrong path and got into a rather narrow tunnel, one that, when advancing each time, would get narrower and narrower. Moments passed and he realized that this was not the tunnel he was looking for. The more he got in with his head and arms, the harder it was to return out. He was stuck and he thought that the only way to get out of that mess was to continue ahead, not knowing that there was no way to turn back. Terror took hold of the situation. John exhaled and sucked air out of his lungs to be able to flatten his chest. Then he advanced further. However, fate took a hold when John went to take a breath again. His lungs expanded, leaving him trapped under pressure inside the cave. He was alone, and when he struggled and tried to back away, the flashlight that was on his forehead fell off, getting him lost in the tunnel and leaving him totally in the dark. While John was calm, his brother Josh had found his legs and tried to pull him out, but he couldn't, so he told John that he would go to seek help. The cave where John was found was so deep that the rescue team took more than an hour to reach the scene because it was so narrow. Only a person with a certain bodily characteristics could enter so that they would not be trapped either. The rescue work seemed to be easy, just grab his legs and pull. Susie, who was a volunteer for knowing the caves, took care of going to where John was. By this time, he had already been face down and stuck for more than three hours. However, he talked to her and told her that he really wanted to get out and she told him not to worry because they would have him out of there very soon. Susie tied a rope to his feet and they pulled between three people, but it didn't work. She tried to accommodate him in different positions, but this didn't work either. She tried to cut his clothes to give him a few more centimeters of space and even another member of the aid team descended and pierced the wall. But still, there was no good results. John had been on his stomach for too many hours making it difficult for his heart to pump blood that accumulated in his chest and on his head. The rescuers did everything in their power, like using a pulley system as they did years ago with another young man in a similar situation, but that other person was much smaller. John was 6 feet and weighed 189 pounds, so the pull was so painful that everyone began to fear the unthinkable. Later they realized that the only way to get John out was by breaking his legs, but nobody wanted to do that so they tried to continue with the pulley plan. Twelve hours later, John was in a panic and began getting claustrophobic. The only way to calm him down was talking to his wife, who spoke to him through a radio. Nineteen hours later, the bow holding the hand rope with the pulley broke, causing loads of rocks to fall on John. The rescuer who was with him at the time was also hit by these rocks, knocking him out and breaking his jaw. Sadly, the last rescuer who entered experiencing the worst pain, which was hearing John finally admit defeat. I'm going to die, right? The rescuer promised John that they would take him out, and John's last words were to ask about the other rescuer. Is he okay? And after that, John lost consciousness and stopped talking. It was almost 28 hours of panic at 215 meters deep in the cave, Bob's Push, which had an L shape and was only 18 inches wide and 25 centimeters high. It was difficult to abort the mission. A paramedic declared that he was dead, even though he knew that John could still only be unconscious. His wife did not want to leave the place, and the lieutenant and the sheriff convinced her, saying that they would take him out to bury him. But everyone knew that this would not happen either, 
just as it was impossible to try to get him out alive when he could push and wiggle without life. It would be much more complex. The cave was sealed and today his remains rest in that very place. I've had some unexplainable things happen to me while playing video games. Either bottled characters would show up with their names that related to me on a personal level, like my search results, or sometimes I would join a lobby and felt like I wasn't supposed to be there. It's hard to describe. Have you ever wandered around on old Minecraft files, for example? Not in multiplayer mode or a friend's server. Just you and yourself looking at a world that you made years ago. It has this eerie, almost liminal feeling to it. You know you're alone, but then you can't help but question if you really are. Maybe it's just me, but it always felt like something was watching me. Now I can chalk all that up to being paranoid or something. However, I have a few instances that I still cannot explain to this day. Example 1. This isn't anything paranormal, but once whilst playing the Elder Scrolls Oblivion about 10 years ago, I fought an enemy called Goblin Assassin during a quest where you're asked to defend some farm from a goblin horde. Afterwards, I repeated the quest multiple times in several different playthroughs and I've never encountered the goblin assassin again. I rummaged through everything in my folders. It doesn't exist in the game's files. It doesn't exist in the test room. I have absolutely no explanation for it. Example 2. I have a Mandela effect with Fable 3 of all games. There's a level toward the end of the game where your character and his mentor, Walter, travel to a distant land to discover some true evil that was coming to threaten the world. In the process, you both get separated and trapped in a dark tomb. Now I distinctly remember a part of that level where you play as Walter, who is cripplingly afraid of the dark. He can't fight and just slowly walks through the dark ruins with a torch while some dark ambience plays around you. Stuff like statues falling, shadow monsters showing up and disappearing in the distance, etc. This all happened until, at the end, where he's captured and you go back to your character. I remember it even more clearly because Walter's dialogue the entire time is just him angrily saying, Balls, 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 over and over again through the course of the scene. A friend and I, who were playing it at the same time, made it into a dumb meme as well. We would talk about that level and start to repeat the word balls over and over again as a goof. Well, turns out that never happened. Walter just disappears when you're separated. There's no segment when you can't fight and are forced to walk. The game just plays like normal, spawning enemies to fight in a dungeon. Still no idea what happened, and it feels like I'm being gaslit every time I search for it on Google. Example 3. I don't know if this counts as paranormal, but... There was this group of quests in a Fallout game that revolved around a small group of people. I remember them all having similar names to people that I knew when I was growing up. Most of them were unique names too, or at least unique spellings. As the player, I had to read about the group, their final moments, and learn about how they died. I couldn't save them either, because they're already dead by the time you get to their hideout. Another time, in Fallout 3's The Pit, I remember playing it on the PlayStation 3 at the time. Long story short, there was a quest involving a baby, Marie, who was deemed as a cure to everything. Resistant to radiation, poison, trog degeneration, all that stuff. However, due to me having the cannibal perk and also due to me being super bored that day, I clearly remember choosing an option to eat the baby at the end with my cannibal perk. The game prompted a dialogue box calling me a monster and completely tarnishing my karma in the game. But everywhere I look, I'm just told that I was playing some sort of unofficial PC mod. Problem with that is, I never played PC. I was playing this on the PS3, plus my internet was terrible back when the DLC was released, so I would remembered downloading something like this because it would have taken ages to finish and install. I can't explain what happened, but I know that I remember clearly getting the text box after eating the baby and being like, man, that's awful. But cool, they respected the immersion all the same. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. 
I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, balls, balls, balls.